we're gonna start now okay <laughs> um so welcome everyone to our last lecture before the holidays today we've invited nina payne and madeline moray from futurist and maya obe and aya need her from Gas design so Futurist is an online magazine and community space for design politics. As a queer intersectional feminist platform, Futurist strives to be a home for the, for the histories, people and perspectives that have been and still often remain underpresented, oppre underpresented, oppressed and ignored. They practice by running online workshops on design research and publishing original reporting and writing. The mission is to hold power accountable, give space to those who are seldom represented and make the future more imaginable. Tonight, Futurist has teamed up with Depatricast Design. Depatricast Design is a nonprofit design research platform uh, whose investigative and activist practice is rooted in interse intersectional feminism. Founded in 2017, the Patrick has design was born out of frustration with a design discipline that is deeply interwoven with discriminating uh, structures. Now they focus on steering alternative modes of teaching design, initiating workshops, bringing like-minded people together to learn from and with each other. In tonight's lecture, Futurist and Patrick has design will unpack their research and report that examine structural discrimination involving racism, sexism, transphobia, and ableism at major Swiss institutions. They will begin with an overview of decolonization and depatricization of universities, followed by grievances uh, by students and educators about their experiences in design schools in Switzerland. The lecturer will ultimately present a historical and geographical overview of similar issues across Europe, uh, mapping some grassroots initiatives that aim to shed light and bring these topics to wider public debates, which seek to spark a transformation of art and design education. Now I'll give the floor to Futurist and Depatricus Design. Thank you so much, Thanks, Paula. So much. Um, it's really a huge pleasure for us to be here with you tonight. Um, I will start with an apology. I don't know if you can hear, but I have a very loud son who's like talking to my parents in Brazil. So uh, apologies. I'll, I won't be speaking much tonight, but um, there's going to be some like noise, ambient noise. Uh, first, I would like to start by um, introducing us. So my name is Nina Paim. I'm a Brazilian design curator and design researcher. And uh, since three weeks ago, Medi, uh, a co-founder of the magazine and community space for design politics, Futurist. Um, I would like to introduce, first of all, I don't know in which of the screens you have, uh, Maya Ober, who is a designer, a researcher, an educator, a writer, and an activist based here in Basel, Switzerland, and a neighbor. Uh, she holds a BA in industrial design from the Holland Institute of Technology and is currently finishing her MA in design research in Bern here in Switzerland. She's a, as a, uh, Paula mentioned, the founding editor of the Patriarchal Design, and here uh, she works at the, at the research, as a research associate at the Institute of Industrial Design and as a lecturer at the Institute of Aesthetic Practice and Theory at the, at the Academy of Arts and Design in Basel, where together with Laura Preger, she has developed an educational program called Imagining Otherwise, looking at how intersectionality can inform design practice. She's also the co-director of Educating Otherwise, a continued education program for design educators at, at the FINV Academy of Art and Design in Basel. And Anya Neidher, her partner in crime at the Petriarchal Design, is a PhD student at UMEA Institute of Design at the UMEA Center for Gender Studies in Sweden. Uh, her research aim is to identify and analyze alternative intersectional and feminist practices that could be implemented by design archives and museums in order to contribute to the development of more just disciplines. Uh, before um, starting her PhD, she has worked as a self-employed design journalist and educator. She actually completed her MA uh, from the Design Academy Eindhoven, so she's an alumna tonight. And she um, has contributed numerous pieces of text to various magazines, and also she contributes regularly to the Patriarchal Design. And lastly, but not least, Madeline Morlay is a brilliant um, 
Berlin, Berlin based brilliant writer, editor and researcher originally from London. She's especially interested in histories of design, media, and feminism, often seeking to combine the tools of journalism and archival research. She was previously senior editor at AIGA Ion Design and has also worked as an editor for Mag Culture and It's Nice That. The writing has appeared in Days and Confused magazine, The Observer, Another Elephant Eye, Creative Review, and I could go on and on and on. And it's a huge pleasure to have Mag Maddie as a partner and futurist, uh, I would like to say, which is uh, also co-founded by Corinne, Corinne Giesel. I'm not sure if Corinne is here with us tonight, but she, uh, they are definitely with us in spirit. Um, so who's going to be sharing? I am, I think. So I'll go for that. Uh, can people see my screen? Can somebody yes. give me a Yes, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I don't think we need to do much more further introduction. I mean, Paul already said <laughs> a lot of extensive stuff about us. So let's cut to the chase and start at the, at the heart of it. The first slide, Mandy. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us. It's uh, extremely excited an important time to be. So um, we will be talking about research which focuses on diversity issues um, uh, in Swiss design schools. So within the particular Swiss uh, context, Mehdi, I think you have to switch the slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, but of course we, we want to also contextualize it a little bit uh, saying where yeah, where this uh, research is coming from and, and what are the movements that are uh, fueling these discussions uh, that we were mentioned about decolonization of design education and depatriarchization of design education. So um, here we mapped a few movements that we find uh, to be essential to these discussions. And also it is important to, to also mention that uh, they also operate um, on the ground as activist movements, but also digitally with a very broad presence uh, online, on social media, etc. So one of them is Road Must Fall, which, was, which began as a protest at the University of Cape Town, where the students and educators, but mostly students, asked for the statue of Cecil Rhodes, who was colonial prime minister of the Cape Colony and British imperialists to be removed from the property of the university. And then, so they were asking for both symbolic and epistemologic and, um, uh, and also content-wise uh, decolonizing of the universities. And the movement started with the hashtag roads must fall, which led eventually to the removal of the statue but really ignited this discussion about the decolonization of education and what it entails. And this discussion is not only at the universities, at the social sciences departments, but this discussion is also happening now within design and art schools. Then another movement that is really uh, fundamental to what we will be talking about is New Una Menos, which started in 2015 um, in Argentina. Uh, as, a as a grassroots feminist movement campaigning against the gender-based violence. And then it also spread a lot around Latin America and Spain and France and also uh, influenced um, then the Me Too movement as well. And Me Too movement, even though it was originally initiated on MySpace, I don't know if any one of you remembers MySpace in uh, 2006, by Tarana Borg as a space for women of color who have been sexually abused, but it predominantly intensified from 2017 after a tweet by Alisa Milano, who asked during the Harvey Weinstein um, um, case, who asked on Twitter everyone who have been sexually harassed to respond to her tweet, me too, and then it went all over and here you can see also a picture 
on the right, um, on the top, we deserve a rape-free campus. This was the protest of students against sexual harassment at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. So this is kind of uh, the environment that uh, I think and the activism that is nurturing these discussions and that it's really important to, to, to be talking to contextualize and to situate it. But we focused on, on Switzerland. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And therefore, we would like to shortly tell you uh, about the specifics and particularities of the Swiss context. So um, Switzerland is this very small, uh, but very wealthy country in Central Europe, I would say. And uh, women in Switzerland gained only in 1971 the right to vote in federal elections following a referendum. So Swiss is semi-direct democracy. Uh, and the con confederations of 26 cantons, so 26 small states. And therefore, all the changes, political changes, they have to go through this um, uh, referendum. So, so the people are voting. In this case, men, Swiss men were voting. And just to give you some context, in the Netherlands, women gained uh, the right to vote in 1919. The first country to grant women the right to vote was New Zealand in 1893. So 78 years after New Zealand, women in Switzerland uh, got this um, right to vote and to participate actively as candidates. Yeah, and 52 years after the Netherlands, just to give you some context. And the last canton uh, that gained the right to vote in cantonal elections, uh, Appenzell in Horden, it was just yet yeah, 30 years ago or less, yeah, in 1991. And then to just understand it, um, until the late 80s, women in Switzerland by law needed a legal permission from their father or spouse to work outside of the household and only from 2004, so it's like 16 years only, there is a law uh, granting women 80% paid maternity leave. So before there was no paid maternity leave, which obviously influenced how many women who maybe wanted to have family and children, uh, how they could participate in the labor market and to work outside of the household. And this year, after a referendum, two weeks long paternity leave was granted to men. Um, next slide. So as you can see here, that you see Flora Ruka Troncati, who was a great architect, and she was the first female professor at all at ETH, which is this uh, University of Technology in Zurich, a very elite and super established famous school and she received this full professorship in 1985 just to compare Harriet Luke uh, first female professor in the United States in 1871 so you can count almost more than 110 years afterwards and at the time when she received this professorship she needed a um, a written permit, permission from her husband to even be able to work. And then let's go further. And then except of that, how um, Switzerland patriarchal structures are very entangled in uh, Swiss landscape, let's say, uh, is also a country with, I think, one of the highest percentage of foreign population in Europe. So it's 20, around 25%. In some cities, it's even more. Uh, and nevertheless, and some of these people, they are already second or third generation of people born in Switzerland, but still are not citizens be due to very strict citizenship laws uh, in the country. And also to give you more <laughs> um, of things, um, yeah, Switzerland also, it's one could say um, that there's issue of xenophobia, and there was this very controversial referendum in 2009 that banned the constructions of minarets. And there is this feeling of intensified Islamophobia in Switzerland that it's also kind of like justified by law. So this is to give you um, like an overall where from where are we talking from, where, where, where are we located at? 
Thank you, Maya. Um, after that, I will now talk a bit about the theoretical background of our presentation and the report that we did. So the movements that Maya spoke about in the beginning have much in common. One major issue is that they address the prevailing norm of a white, straight, able-bodied cis man and its impact. Anyone who deviates from this norm is rendered through their otherness. Even if we study at the same university, even though we work in the same company as our white straight male colleagues, it can feel like we are in a different world, as feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed puts it in her book, Living a Feminist Life. This issue of a prevailing norm that makes life easier for some and harder for others is one of the issues that also brings students in design schools together. Many of them refer in their activism to decolonial thinking and to feminist theory. Zara Ahmed understands feminism as a way of challenging the universal, as she says. She also writes, questioning sexism is one of the most profound ways of disrupting what we take to be given. And also feminist theory taught her that the universal is what needs to be exploded. Next slide. However, as soon as we point out a problem, we are perceived as what she names killjoys. We are killing the joy of those who travel through the system of design education without any problems. Those who have a smooth way that leads from design studies straight to becoming established well-earning designers. And we kill the joy of those who are continuously teaching the male and Eurocentric canon of design history and theory. By questioning the current state, we kill the joy of all those who profit from exactly this status quo. As Ahmed says, we become a problem when we describe a problem. And also, quote, we make things bigger just by refusing to make things smaller. Next slide. Before leaving her position in an academic institution to work as an independent scholar, Ahmed was active as a diversity worker. In this role, she experienced how frustrating it can be to change institutions. Quote, it is difficult. It is difficult. Our own efforts to transform institutions can be used by institutions as evidence that they have been transformed. End of quote. She explains, indeed, as I conducted my research into diversity within universities, I became aware of how diversity can be used by organizations as a form of public relations. And she also points out, Within the organization, there's a gap between words and deeds, between what organizations say they will do or what they are committed to doing and what they are actually doing. But still, she also says, feminists in the academy have pushed over decades for changes to curricula. It is difficult to reveal that sexist and racist experiences are not just individual experiences that happen randomly. It is hard to show how they are connected. Ahmed says, the very systematic nature of sexism and racism is obscured because of the systematic nature of sexism and racism. So many of those incidents that wear us down, that we don't speak of, that we learned not to speak of. We have learned to severe the connection between this event and that, between this experience and that. To make a connection is thus to restore what has been lost. It is to generate a different picture." End of quote. In sharing our experiences, all the small instances we encounter, we can identify patterns and bigger structures. This is what so many students are doing right now. They share and connect and speak up. And we as Futurist and the Patriarchist Design teamed up to listen to some of them. So we initiated two panel discussions um, as part of this year's National Swiss Awards um, Alternative Programming. And based on the panel discussions, we wrote a report and published it on our two websites. First, a little about the panel discussions themselves. 
across the 13 participants, there were students or staff hailing from design academies across six out of seven universities of applied sciences in Switzerland, including the University of Applied Sciences and Arts Northwestern's Academy of Art and Design, the Cantonal Art School of Lausanne, Geneva School of Art and Design, Zurich University of the Arts, Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts, and the University of Arts Bern. The group of students was made up of cis women, cis men, queer people, white people, people of color, one non-binary binary person, Swiss nationals, and people of other nationalities, all studying in Switzerland. The group of educators was largely made up of cis white women, but also included cis white men, people of color, and people with non-Swiss nationality. The 13 participants agreed to let us report on the conversations on the condition that their statements are anonymized to protect them from possible retaliations from within the institution or from peers. Many recent student um, actions across Europe and North America have come up in the form of co-signed or anonymously signed letters and petitions. Anonymously run social media accounts and anonymous methods of reporting incidents through accounts. Um, there was recently um, in the Netherlands, the Instagram handle at calling out Dutch institutions that you um, might know of. Here are some more initiatives. Um, a lot of them happened during the pandemic and the pandemic has actually accelerated these developments. So anonymous accounts like these suggest that right now students at design and art schools feel the need to either become a critical mass of support or to create structures of protection to feel safe coming forward. Again, this is to underline the structural issues at play and the fact that schools must work harder to encourage students and staff to feel safer and heard when making complaints. Next slide. I, okay. While our report speaks with students and um, or staff at six um, art institutions in Switzerland, the issues discussed are structural made all the more apparent by the fact that similar experiences are being shared online by students in predominantly white male dominated institutions. The lived experiences of racism and sexism shouldn't be read as isolated experiences. Rather, they should be understood as systematic problems within higher education. So this report is therefore not about making specific accusations or verifying individual claims. Rather, it's a look behind closed doors, a listening in on discussions going on. So um, we're gonna we're gonna do an overview of the report um, that we wrote and published on both platforms, and um, kind of take you through some of the conversations that took place uh, between the students on one hand and then the educators on the other. So the first section of our report. Um, began with one of the reoccurring themes that really uh, came through in both roundtable discussions. And what became apparent is that all the institutions kind of represented, diversity is really desired by those institutions. But what the speakers suggested in kind of unpacking that is that internal support systems that really understand how people are disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression, those those don't seem to be adequately supplied. So we'll go into detail about this later, um, but this is just to kind of set up the theme of this first section. So one educator in the round table voiced concerns about this paradox in a way that we found pertinent and said, you know, if I try to address the situation, I get comments like this is too ideological. I feel that there's a fear of losing privileges so for the report, we wanted to unpack this more by looking into who exactly occupies top management positions at Switzerland's design academies uh, and to better understand their makeup in terms of representation. So one thing we found is that 
71.4% of the directors of academies of art and design yeah. in Switzerland are cis men. I'm going to I'm going to let Maya chime in here on how we arrived at these numbers and the methodology. Thank you. So obviously there was like a lot of labor behind um behind this data that we are showing you because there's no disinformation it's not just available so what we did methodologically um, with the quantitative research is uh, to look at um, when we looked at the directors of uh, Swiss academies of design and arts we went to each website of, of each institution and some of these websites are not really user friendly and then we looked um, we tried to find out um, the organigram so how the institution works like who who is at the top position what is the structure and then looking at the directorship we looked at the official profiles on the websites of each institution and we read the bio and we looked at what pronouns are being used to be even able to establish um, gender of these people because this is actually the only thing that we could establish since um, as far as we know uh, there is no uh, information collected or data collected about ethnicity of these people so we only could focus on on gender looking at the pronouns and then let's go to the second slide so here you can see all the directors of um, seven academies of art and design in in switzerland uh, this is these are the official pictures from 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 the website um, that we took and we collected and then and then we also looked at at departments so uh, since each institution has a very different structures the only kind of common denominator that we could establish uh, is um, are the courses so BA and MA courses in design so afterwards we will be also talking about the quantitative data looking at the gender ratio uh, of the heads or the heads of the um, uh, design majors. So we looked particularly only at design majors. Uh, so graphic design, visual communication, industrial design, fashion, etc. We didn't look at fine arts or art education or other courses offered by these institutions. And this was really a lot of quantitative work looking at the Excel. If any of you is interested more in this methodology and how we how we did it we will be super happy to provide you some tips just drop us a line and, and we can also talk about it more um, yes and and then there was um and then coming from this picture uh and from uh and from this quantitative data we moved to qualitative data uh, during the round tables with students and educators that now Mehdi will continue to tell you about. So we, we presented some of this data specifically um, to the educators and the students and one educator in a way that kind of summarized that section of the conversation said that looking at these directors um, they have a super narrow understanding when it comes to the experiences of those who do not look like them or identify like them and they make their decisions based on those experiences. So the homogenous makeup of leadership, um, we found the students were saying that it really permeates um, into the rest of their department staff too. So one student said that there's no black indigenous or people of color teaching at their department. Another said that they only had one female teacher throughout the whole of their studies. Another says only one teacher of color taught them. Other comments were things like, my department is not diverse, it's dominated by men. And in regards to gender, as Maya said, we were able to corroborate these observations by statistics and numbers. So according to the research, we found that at Hage Ka, 93.8% of heads of design majors at BA and MA uh, level are male. At ECAL, it's 83.3% are male. We found that 0% of leadership positions and design majors are held by staff outside of the gender binary. 
And then we found specifically looking at the BA level for the visual communication at these various institutions, we found that at Hagika, 16.7% of um, teaching staff at BA level are female. At ECAL, it's 19.4% female. At Zedhadika, it's 20%. And then this number just kind of gives you an idea of how dire the overview was because at HSLU, this was the most inclusive inclusive of female teaching staff and that was 27.8% um, female. So during the roundtable conversation with the students, they expanded on the ways in which this staff uh, breakdown and this super narrow understanding described before how it really impacts them um, and their cohorts on a day-to-day -day basis. So one student said, I personally would often feel uneasy during jury presentations and I couldn't really describe why. And then I realized it was because I was the only woman in the room with 10 men who all looked the same. A graduate from a very international uh, master's class in design describes how, quote, the foreign students have to tone themselves down all the time. We feel this on a daily basis. The students talked about how Swiss culture is known to be reserved and has its own culturally determined understanding of politeness. There can be a palpable lack of understanding and empathy when it comes to cultural differences in communication. And this was one of the topics that um, was spoken about in depth. Another topic that came up um, was a student describing how questions of class are rarely addressed. Um, and they talked about how many non-Swiss students at their particular school have to take on side jobs to stay in Switzerland. And the context kind of, that's important to remember here is that um, Switzerland's major cities, they're currently ranked as some of the most expensive places uh, to live worldwide. Um, so that kind of really helps contextualize this particular statement. Um, and at the same university of this particular student, they described how there are scholarships for Swiss students, but no scholarships for foreign students and talked about the ways in which heavy competition, a demanding atmosphere and a general sense of discouragement towards part time work really puts pressure on those who need the financial income to survive and to be able to stay studying. Expanding on class and the experiences of foreign students, um, one, one other student said that those who are, who are studying art here that are foreign, they already have the possibilities to study, the ability to live in Zurich, to have money to eat. So we looked a little bit further into some of the fees um, after the conversation around students and foreign students, particularly studying in Switzerland. And we found that the semester fees um, are higher than for Swiss students often. So just to pull one particular number here at HGK, it's 714.3% more so for uh, non-EU passport holder students. And all the while it's apparent that many of the academies um, of design really seek to attract international yes. students. Um, and That's they explicitly um, express this in their marketing copy and many of the students also spoke during the roundtable conversation about the ways in which they also were um, kind of pulled to these institutions because of this this picture that the marketing copy was painting of diversity so here on the head website for instance it describes itself as driven by diversity welcoming of exchange students from all around the world which contribute to the quote, uh, the diversity and richness of the campus. Here on Hage, uh, Hakabe's website, you can see that it profiles itself as an international multilingual university with students and staff from over 30 countries. And within this, um, one of the things that we found is that language plays a really powerful and important role. And language became a big theme of the student conversation in particular. And, you know, um, one, one round table student remarked how the two most diverse programs at that, at that particular school are offered in English. And they were talking about the way that for those that don't have a Swiss German 
native tongue, this, this choice um, to have a course in English is profoundly meaningful. And the kind of importance that English plays in being a bridging language um, for, uh, for, for students entering these schools. Students uh, who, there were a group of students in particular who had enrolled at a school because it was offering a course in English. And they went on to describe their experiences with language accessibility. And they talked about how it can be a type of battle um, to actually be able to have what they were told that they would have in terms of language. Their individuals needs are not met and they kind of voiced their frustrations around this after being brought in on the assumption that they'd be able to converse in English. So here are two quotes. There's, there's a longer section on it in the report itself that touch on this. One student says, there is a website at my school that lists all the stipends and grants you can receive, but if you don't speak German, it's not so easy to find online. Another student um, who had enrolled in a course uh, that was specifically offered in English said, I noticed that this year the new class is entirely Swiss German speaking, so after diversity, the teachers just seem to have said, we don't want to speak English, we don't need all this mess. An educator also um, unpacked some of this um, and had something interesting to say in, in terms of shining a light on the behind the scenes of diversity conversations at that particular school and how old fashioned the institution can be in regards to issues of diversity. They said, of course, our institution has a diversity department, but it shows us a video clip and it's in Swiss German. I understand half of it. It's mostly about very traditional heterosexual models asking questions like, what do you do to deal with equal salaries between men and women? So it's still at that level. It's something, a good start, but only a very small part of the problem. And here it's just worth mentioning um, that Swiss German is a dialect of German. And even for German speakers, um, it can be really difficult to understand Swiss German. So it's like there's multiple layers um, of, of kind of uh, difficulty here. This quote also suggests that there can be a tendency to cater to cis women only. Um, and this was a, a reoccurring theme in relation to gender officers at design school. And therefore the needs of trans students and those who identify outside of the gender binary are not accounted for. The students in the round table, um, the, the kind of way that we ended the first part of the round table discussion is all of them were voicing the way that they're concerned that diversity issues are increasingly becoming a performative trend for their art schools to tell, but that these schools then don't address these issues within their structures themselves. So when, when we talk about structural change in institutions, um, that for example, might mean developing anti-discrimination guidelines and um, reporting mechanisms or instating affirmative action policies to increase the diversity of the teaching body. So we had lots of quotes from the students around this particular topic, but here's one um, just to close this section. A student said, sometimes I wonder how real is the commitment of working with the aspect of diversity and how much of this is pure tokenism. So our second section um, dove further into the grievances students off the round table had so students in particularly in regards to discrimination at their institutions. In our particular round table, six of the seven students um, said they had witnessed and or experienced racism or structural violence firsthand. Two out of seven of them said they had personally experienced sexual harassment at their institution. One student told us um, a list of things that um, had been overheard by her cohort from their teachers and another detailed and described a clearly racist attack that they witnessed where a teacher questioned a student's cultural identity in a public presentation. And in the report, um, we have many um, kind of examples and instances um, woven throughout. Both the students and one educator in the educators round table discussed how um, they felt 
muted when they address these problems within their institutions, which raises the question of how and where these questions can be raised at all. So here's a quote from a student who said, anytime we try to speak about inclusivity, we are told that we're doing sociology, that it had nothing, uh, not anything to do with the school. And the statement we found really echoed one from an educator who um, was specifically talking about how when she tries to address gender issues in her department, she receives the answer, but we're not gender studies. So when these conversations are excluded from design education, institutions not only express indifference towards their students, but they per perpetuate the problematic myth that design is supposedly mutual or objective. Yes, so continuing on, on that note about um, this myth of uh, a political neutral design uh, that unfortunately is still very much uh, present uh, as we heard from the students and both educators in Swiss uh, design education. In the third part of the report, we wanted to focus on particularly on the contents of design education. So what is being what is being told, who's missing, which voices are dominant, and to kind of learn how these issues of design politics uh, are being addressed, if they are addressed. Next slide. Um, so kind of like departing from the idea how uh, design is a powerful tool, how it's persuasive, and how it's never neutral, we, um, we ask the students um, whether the politics of design is even present in their classrooms, in the assignments, in the bibliography. And then maybe in the next slide, Manny. And then one of the students um, said that the politics of design is rarely or never addressed in their curricula. And then following on that, we asked them how these issues, how the issues of design, race, gender, class, ethnicity, sexuality, ability, and more are discussed, if at all in the departments, we ask both the educators and the students. And one MA student said that the questions of identity are not present. So again, this kind of like idea of universality and neutrality um, and this embodied design education. And then a BA student from the same school said, if one is interested in critical discussions, one generally needs to look for them. So there, here comes this issue of labor that is being put on the students, that the students have to actively look for the content. So this particular one also mentioned one queer theory uh, course that was great, but in general, these are, um, let's say, fringes of design education and not like the mainstream content. Um, and the next slide, and then exactly. And then particularly because Swiss design um, has become in course of the years, such a big brand, let's say. Um, so one student says that it is, the they feel that it is a massive thing and there is this predominant idea of the universal and that's the way it's taught that Swiss design is the best solution so they the student refers uh, to the educators do not critically talk about Eurocentrism and what it means for for design practice what it means for the students in the room um, and what it means for the society um, and then another um, kind of like following on that, um, and one educator was speaking about this ego. So uh, they said the school has an ego and a super ego, and the two of them are dominated by traditions and by a history of the field, which is white male dominated in the orthodoxy. So kind of we can see here that um, the issue of representation is very, very much important because it's it's about who is represented, who is teaching, what bodies are, are teaching, and then what ideas are being uh, about design, what histories, what narratives are, are being then uh, transmitted in the classroom, and also what kind of design is being encouraged 
etc. So if design education bases itself in this uh, idea of universality, then there, there's a lot that is being missed in between. Um, yeah, and then another educator continues uh, continued speaking about this, saying that a lot of teachers in theory come from German speaking countries, and this educator uh, comes from a non-German speaking country, which comes from a very traditional hardcore understanding of how humanities design thinking and artistic thinking should be. This kind of group, which is very homogenous, is very powerful. It is dangerously leading the discussion about how art and design schools should, in a critical sense, engage with society. So yet again, this idea of um, uh, hegemonist discourses that are leading the discussion and then are shaping the content of um, design education. And, and then what, what, what was really interesting to see is that even though this content on, about politics of design is acutely missing from the curricula, as we were told by the students, the students still do and engage in projects on politics and power, uh, even though they don't have like a safe space to talk about it or they don't have institutional support from their educators to uh, engage in this uh, in this critical um, uh, in this critical discourse. So so we can see in a way how uh, how students are are there and doing this this labor. Um, and then this is something that was really clear uh, after these two round eight tables that the students seem to have answers to these issues and they seem to have answers to how uh, anti-discriminatory design education could look like. But then, um, and then they say uh, that if the situations are not acceptable, we should not accept them. And to counter structural violence, there needs to be action, rapid action taking place. So the students were referring to um, also to the instances of, um, of racism and sexism and structural discrimination directed at students, but also to the content of design education and what is being taught in the classroom, because these both are connected. And then we come kind of to the question of labor. So who is doing this labor of challenging and uh, this narratives and challenging uh, the status quo within, within the institutions. So one student said that all the work was done by the mostly female student. It took up a lot of energy addressing questions like how come we have no female teachers? How come all of our classrooms except for one are named after men, etc. So how come we have only mostly white male um, authors in the bibliography, um, etc. So this issue, so this labor of pointing at the problems and discussing and bringing it into a public debate, uh, is this labor is done by the students who are directly impacted by that, but actually the students are not paid for providing this labor. Uh, educators and the uh, leadership of the institutions should be doing this labor of uh, decolonizing and depatriarchizing uh, design education and bringing this criticality. So this was something that we could really establish and was repeating uh, itself in the, uh, in the uh, stories that the students said. And then, um, and then we could see how this labor of students and also of some of educators, it's uh, but mostly of students, it's like inherently activist labor. And then we could see this par parallel between design and activism and how uh, activism can support design and vice versa. And then one educator was talking about like how 
it, there is a possibility for interventions and visible interventions in the space of the school and in a public way. So, so it also kind of like um, shows this relation between design and activism and how we could use it as a tool to make this um, debates and issues public. And then um, kind of um, summarizing uh, it, this whole, the issue of labor and constantly speaking up and being the killjoy in the room. Uh, one educator said that it's, it's really exhausting, but um, also exciting at the time. So to finish up, um, we would like to share some thoughts on the process of making this research together, on the labor of making this research together, uh, writing together collectively. So maybe as you remember, we kind of framed this in the beginning as a task force, and it really needed to be a task force in order to, to work, because neither of us would have had the capacity or the time to do all of this alone. So we split ourselves to do the quantitative survey that uh, Maya talked a little bit about. Literally, we split schools amongst ourselves so that we were each looking at different data. Um, and then we also sl split each other to brief each participant so they would feel comfortable enough to share their feelings and experiences with us who are strangers. But we listened collectively. And then we split to transcribe the roundtables, to do further reporting, to put together the text and then to do several vigorous rounds of editing, as we like to say. Such a process is not free of problems and internal conflicts, but then again, what is? It is a spirit of collectivity that we would like to invoke here at the end. All of the information we share with you tonight depended on many different brains, minds, hands, ears, and voices, not only of the participants who share their, ex their experiences with us, but also I would like to single out Ananida Heuser from the Swiss Ministry of Culture, who's a true ally, and the journalist and design research Corinne Giselle, our partner at Futurist. With that, I want to end with a few words of Sara Ahmed. Ahmed, who has been for us a kind of master Yoda, a lightning guide, an endless source of inspiration and strength. These reflections that I will share, um, uh, it's something that she published earlier this year in her blog, Feminist Killers. It's a draft for a final chapter for her forthcoming book called Complaint in which she looks at complaints on harassment and discrimination and other forms of institutional violence. Um, in this new book, Ahmed says, she has assembled a complaint collective. My task in conclusion is to reflect on how complaint collectives work, how we assemble ourselves. A collective is a collection of stories, of experience, but also more than that, more than a collection. So Ahmed goes on to talk about the first time she presented this material, how she was standing on a stage and the lights were out and how she could hear the audience, the sounds, the groans, sometimes somebody would laugh, would laugh, but you could not see anyone. And I, I think here tonight, we also don't see anyone. We see like black squares of, of, of video. And for us, this is also the first time we share this, this, um, this research. So I feel like we can connect to those words. The words that she was speaking, they were so heavy. She was con conscious of their weight, the pain in them. But as she read the words that she had that had been shared with her with her, she knew that the words were also behind her, supporting her. And I think that's also what we feel here today, that us sharing these uh, words and these uh, quotes with you, it's also a way uh, for us to support ourselves in this ongoing journey of like doing this work. I felt you there, all of you, because you were there, helping me withstand the pressure I felt under to do the best I could do, to share the words so that they could be picked up heard by others who might have been there too, that painful place, that difficult place. Complaint can be a place, so your words could do something, so your words could go somewhere. A complaint collective can be a feeling we have of being there for each other, with each other, because of what we have been through. We recognize each other from what we have been through. We even know each other. It can be hard to convey in writing how much that feeling matters. And I, I think I speak for everybody here that you know, the feeling. A collective can be a support system. What we need, who we need to keep a complaint going. Sara Ahmed talks about how sharing these words, more words have been shared with her. 
So many people have come up, up to her after her lectures uh, to share um, similar stories of complaint. We want to keep that going. And this is why we chose to do this lecture tonight. A collective we combine. How we combine. That combination can be a matter of hearing. I listened to each account and I listened again, transcribing, reflecting, thinking, feeling. This is also what all we do. In listening to these, um, Sara Ahmed beca becomes what she calls a feminist ear, as she describes. In this work, we too became feminist ears. Listening out for what is usually kept inaudible, who is made inaudible, hearing about conversations that mostly happen behind closed doors. I was able, and here I'm again quoting from her, I, I was able to hear the sound of institutional machin machinery that clunk, clunk, from those who have tried to stop the machine from working, from those who have come to understand how it works, from whom it works. When I think of the collective assemble here, I think of institutional wisdom, she says. I think of how much we have come to know by combining our forces, our energies. I think of how much we come to know because of the difficulties we have going through. A complaint collective, how we remind ourselves that we are not alone. We need reminders. This lecture, this article, this whole effort is an effort in reminding us. We sound louder when we are heard together. We are louder. Thank you. And you can go to the next slide. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. That was very, um, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, striking yet not surprising, I would say, sadly. Uh, but also, I feel like at the same time, it feels quite empowering that knowing people like you guys are, you know, doing the effort of making the difference. Um, we will get into the Q&A right now. But before that, we would like to announce first that we will stop the recording at this moment. Uh, yes.